My name is Emily Delgado, co-leader for ABLE. ABLE stands for Abolishing Barriers and Limitations for Everyone. Our group supports employees with health challenges and disabilities. Today is a very important day. Today is Martin Luther King Day. And it's good that we are here today because of the intersection of disability rights and civil rights. Today, we will learn about the art of wheelchair ballroom dancing. We have two terrific presenters, Nicole Agaronic, Cornell student and ballroom dancer, and Rick Daniels, All-American gymnast. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Emily, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Agaronic, and this is my ballroom dance partner, Rick Daniels. Together, we use an artistic medium, wheelchair ballroom dancing, to engage in advocacy for people with disabilities. And we would like to share with you an application of our advocacy work towards improving the quality of health care for this group of individuals. In recent years, the medical community has made significant efforts to reduce health care disparities for various minority groups. Unfortunately, the disability community is one particular group for whom these disparities largely persist. About 15% of the world's population has a disability, about one-fifth of all Americans have a disability, and people with disabilities comprise the largest healthcare consumer group in the United States. Even though we have legislation today, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act, that's supposed to protect the legal rights of this group of individuals, there are still factors beyond the law, specifically attitudinal barriers, that legislation alone cannot address. So, some people have proposed the use of creative methods, such as incorporating artistic mediums into medical education, to teach students about the unique cultural and um, identity aspects of this group. Because artistic mediums have the potential to resonate with many people across differences. One such artistic medium that was proposed is wheelchair ballroom dancing, as you see here. Uh, wheelchair ballroom dancing involves a seated and a standing dancer who learn how to move together to music. There's actually a professor of medicine at the University of Southern California who uses wheelchair dance videos to teach her preclinical students about the disability experience. The primary organization in the United States that teaches wheelchair ballroom dancing is the American Dance Wheels Foundation, and they lead uh, teacher certification courses, workshops, classes, and put on performances. But before we jump into the applications of this art form towards medical education, I would like to go back to the source of the attitudinal barriers that people with disabilities experience in healthcare on a daily basis, uh, because this creates the need for an intervention in the first place. And the source of these attitudinal barriers is the medical model of disability, which has shaped healthcare since its you know, very inception in the United States. The core principle of the medical model is that disability is an inherent flaw that needs to be cured or eliminated in order for an individual to experience a satisfactory quality of life. Under the medical model, there is no understanding that disability and normality can coexist. And this has resulted in America's fraught history of involuntary institutionalization, forced sterilization, and electroconvulsive therapy of people with disabilities, a history in which physicians have played a complicit role. Even though we may not have these specific things today, the remnants of the medical model are still present uh, and prevalent in these attitudinal barriers that people with disabilities experience in healthcare on a daily basis. So I would like to first uh, go over what these specific attitudinal barriers are. Then Rick and I will give you our first ballroom dance demonstration. Um, and after that, we will discuss the applications of wheelchair ballroom towards medical education before transitioning into Rick's part of the presentation where he will share his personal uh, experience with us. And then we will finish with a closing number for you. So the first attitudinal barrier is that of staring and the clinical gaze. This may be especially common among medical students and aspiring healthcare practitioners who have limited or no experience around people with disabilities. The clinic should not be like the New York City subway during rush hour. 
Just because you have a patient who has an impairment that you find unusual, you're unfamiliar with it, or you're taken aback by it, doesn't mean that you can stare at it. It's unprofessional, it's rude, and it makes the patient feel like their impairment is an object that's separate from them, and they're not being seen as a whole. The second barrier is that of a fear of contamination. We have this erroneous assumption in our society that somehow disability is contagious. You get too close to an individual with a disability, you talk too much with them, it'll somehow transfer over to you. And this stems from people's fear and anxiety um, around disability and just the, the mere thought of uh, having that experience themselves. themselves. So research on interviews with medical students has shown that they experience a lot of fear and anxiety about interacting uh, with people who have disabilities, that residents often shield medical students from interacting with patients who have disabilities, especially if it happens to be a mental illness. And these interviews show that medical students often use lay language without clinical specificity to describe the disability experience and to describe this mental illness, which just indicates a lack of clinical maturity that can be avoided if they have more exposure and experience with the patient population that they're supposed to learn how to treat. The third one is perhaps one of the largest and least spoken about. We have the assumption in our society that people with disabilities are asexual and uninterested in physical intimacy. Research on women with mobility impairments has shown that they are 70% less likely to be asked about contraceptive use during routine doctor visits. Women with disabilities also report a wide range of attitudes um, about pregnancy from clinicians, such as the assumption that they are incapable of carrying or bearing a child, or that their child will be born with a physical or mental disability too, just because the parents may have one. The fourth barrier is that of society's desire to see people with disabilities overcome disability. That unless they reach, um, you know, strive to become a Paralympian or achieve something that the expectations set for them would normally say that they cannot do, they don't receive as much respect and acceptance among us all. Basically, society wants to see people with disabilities as super crips, which is a term that has been coined by the disability community to describe this expectation. There was a famous comedian, her name was Stella Young, she had um, an interesting way of describing this as society's desire to see people with disabilities as inspiration porn. And this can translate into the clinic because of course it would feel good for a clinician to know that they played a, uh, played a part in the process that helped their patient overcome the expectations set for their disability, you know, become a Paralympian, do something that's completely unexpected of them. But unfortunately, this sends the message to all people with disabilities that unless they strive to accomplish that, that they are not going to receive as much respect and inclusion among everyone else. The fifth barrier is that of excessive admiration. This is a tricky one because for some people with disabilities, uh, performing certain daily tasks may be a struggle. And when they are able to do the, perform those tasks, they may feel um, intrinsically rewarded and appreciate um, admiration when they receive it. You know, making a sandwich in the morning could be a simple thing that they really wanted to do. And when they're able to do it, um, they can feel proud of themselves. However, this does not apply for all people with disabilities. And it's important to remember that if you see someone who happens to have a mobility impairment and they get out of their car outside, um, it's not appropriate to come up and congratulate them and call them inspiring just because they're a person in a wheelchair or who uses a wheelchair. Sorry. Um, and uh, it's important to not let that transfer into the clinic too because then you're just setting subpar standards for all people with disabilities and telling them that you know we don't expect much of all of you as a whole. So I understand that attitudinal barriers are a little bit of a, a down subject, 
But Rick and I would like to give you our first ballroom dance demonstration before um, we transition into the applications of this art form towards medical education. So bear with us. <laughs> There are certain themes that emerge in wheelchair ballroom dancing that can be applied to medical education in order to address the attitudinal barriers that people experience in the clinical setting on a daily basis. Interestingly, the use of dance to build or to teach students about the disability experience is not an entirely new concept. In 1942, Marianne Chase, who was a dance and movement therapy pioneer, used dance to build empathy between patients and their clinicians and therapists in the psychiatric wards of St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, DC. Even though it may not always be possible to have a live demonstration or a hands-on experience with a wheelchair ballroom dance class, there are still themes that emerge in wheelchair ballroom uh, performances that can be applied to the medical setting. So the first thing that you may have noticed when Rick and I perform, our gaze is not impersonal. I'm not staring at Rick's legs like they are uh, something that needs to be avoided. I'm not staring at his wheelchair. We're dancing together and picking up on visual cues. There's also no fear of contamination. We're not scared of using each other's body weight to partner together and move through music. The third thing is that Ballroom dance, like all dance forms, has a sexual nature to it. This was a salsa after all. <laughs> and as explained by disability theater scholar Carrie Sandell, mixed ability dance partnership can disrupt traditional representations of romantic relationships between people with and without disabilities because the interdependence of dance movement emphasizes collaboration and accommodation rather than dominance over the disabled partner. Wheelchair Ballroom also offers an alternative to one of the main ways that's used to teach students about the disability experience within medical school, which is mimesis training or the simulation of disability. That often involves slings, sight-reducing glasses, wheelchairs, and other props to simulate the disability experience. And unfortunately, this can often inculcate ne negative assumptions about the experience of living with a disability. So, those that oppose this kind of simulation training have proposed what they uh, describe as disability equality training instead. And wheelchair ballroom lies more in line with the goals of disability equality training. So what this kind of training would entail is that people with disabilities themselves 
teach medical students and other aspiring healthcare practitioners about their own experience within their own bodies and their own lives. And this can demonstrate some of the harmony and satisfaction that people with disabilities experience instead of just um, creating negative and erroneous, and erroneous assumptions about uh, this experience. So additionally, in my own experience as a wheelchair ballroom dance instructor, uh, I often see these attitudinal barriers uh, when teaching classes for the first time to individuals who have no prior experience with this art form, but also especially if they're standing dancers who have no previous experience around seated dancers or people who use wheelchairs. There's often an avoidance of eye contact, um, standing very far away from the wheelchair, afraid to have their toes rolled over, and often standing behind the seated dancer, assuming that ballroom dancing means that you're going to push the seated dancer around. So all of these things are amplified if a seated dancer has a mental disability in addition to a physical one. So I always address this at the beginning of the lesson. You're supposed to make eye contact with uh, your partner. If you stand closer to the wheelchair, you'll actually be able to use your body weight more easily and uh, move together to, to music more fluidly. You're definitely not supposed to stand behind your partner and push them around. And you can see over the course of a few sessions that there's just general increase in comfort that the partners feel uh, around each other, even before they take the class and after the class. Um, and my favorite thing was to notice this among kids when teaching in the New York City public school system. Uh, they just, there's, they're much more inclusive towards their peers and hopefully this can translate from the dance floor into places like the lunchroom and set the tone for the rest of their lives about including everyone. So with that, oh, which is one more thing. So there were two other attitudinal barriers um, which are overcoming disability and the problem with excessive admiration. After seeing a performer like Rick, it's very easy to think, wow, that's inspiring. If Rick can do it, then any of my patients can, can become that. And it's important to remember that you can't set that same standard for everyone else. And no one is less deserving of, dis of respect and inclusion just because um, they may not fulfill a particular expectation. So with that, I would like to transition to Rick's part of the presentation where he will share his personal experience with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm profoundly grateful to be here with you today. I'm also incredibly honored with the opportunity to present with this young lady. She's incredible. Sorry, this is very cathartic for me. Um, as individuals, she and I are very different. Together, we represent a broad spectrum of diversity on many levels and in many ways. Our collaboration is demonstrative of the capacity for mutual respect, admiration, and unity to bridge differences and create beautiful things with the capacity to inform and foster life. Like the colors of a rainbow, the most intriguing hues of our experience only arise in the connections forged from our each places in the spectrum of life we happen to inhabit. When Nicole and I realized that we'd be presenting on the day our nation celebrates the life and contributions of Dr. Martin Luther King, we were both heartened. How wonderful we thought to be able to stand and dance for freedom, to be catalysts in changing the attitudinal and societal barriers that if they hamper even one of us, they hamper us all. We too share a dream with Reverend King that one day we will live in a world where we view and consider each other equitably for the human beings that we are beyond the human bodies we happen to inhabit. I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce you to a young woman whom I love very much. Maybe, no. Her name was Delinda Sterling. And one day in seventh grade, the teacher glanced toward the doorway and smiled. A few moments later, Delinda strolled in triumphantly in her electric wheelchair. Strolled is the term I used to combine a strut and a roll. <laughs> With a reporter and photographer in tow, she beamed as the teacher introduced her and announced that she was indeed a new member of our classroom. Delinda was born with osteogenesis imperfecta, also known as brittle bone disease. 
So it was, in fact, the first day she had ever attended school outside of the hospital where she lived. I can't even begin to imagine how excruciating it must have been for her mother to decide to entrust her care to others. But the reality of her child being broken with the simplest of daily need care must have been overwhelming. Understandably, it was a decision that Delinda also struggled to reconcile. Sometimes, our greatest challenges in life have less to do with our disabilities and more to do with our different abilities to understand, accept, and live with our circumstances. I believe in divine intervention, and one of my earliest memories is of being transported into an elevator and through a hallway of what I later learned from my mom was the basement of the hospital that I was born in. We should never underestimate what children feel or experience, because while I couldn't possibly comprehend what was happening at the time, I distinctly recall profound feelings of dread and remorse as I gazed up at the nurse who was charged with bringing me down there. Once alone in the unsettlingly dim room I found myself in, I looked to my left, and there in the crib next to me was this brown, round face. It smiled at me, struggling to breathe, as if to say, oh, hello there. And her smile and bright brown eyes shined light into the darkness of our circumstance. I was not alone. This was actually the first time I had ever met Delinda. And so from the moment she entered that classroom, I was drawn to that face and the endearing spirit of the young woman I would grow to love. Sorry. Have you ever had a friend who you could just look at and burst out laughing without even sharing a word because you knew exactly what they were thinking. Delinda and I developed that bond almost immediately, and she was indeed one of my soulmates. We eventually dated, and one quiet afternoon in the hospital, as I held her gently, we talked about life and the world we lived in. At one point, she turned to me and said, Ricky, there's something I need to tell you, and you may be the only person who happens to know this. Sensing her urgency, I pulled away and said, what? She said, when I turn 18, they're going to kick me out of the hospital, and I'm going to have to move to a nursing home. If my life doesn't improve, I'm going to kill myself. The matter of factness of her statement <laughs> was alarming. She went on to say that having grown up in a hospital, she knew exactly how she was going to do it but that when they told me that she died, they wouldn't tell me exactly how. They would simply say, her heart stopped. Our lives took their respective courses, and in the summer after my freshman year of college, I returned home to a message left by Delinda. When I returned her call to the nursing home where she now lived, we spoke briefly about our lives, and she practically begged me to come and see her. But the reality was, it was a long distance away from where I lived. I didn't yet drive or own a car. And I was wrestling with coming out as gay and trying to figure out my own place in the world, which wasn't helped by the substance abuse problem I had developed in self-medicating my own pain and angst in coming of age. When I returned to school in the fall, I called her. And when the young man who answered the phone very frankly said, oh, Delinda, she died. I asked to speak to a nurse. <laughs> Sorry. Explaining that I was a friend, though acutely aware of how self-engrossed I'd been. And only in those moments, reminded of the conversation we had had, I'd said, I know you can't tell me much, but could you please tell me how she died? And she said, her heart stopped. I thanked her, and I told her that was all I needed to hear. While I can't be certain, I'm fairly confident that Delinda's heart had broken long before that day. 
I decided to share Delinda's story after Nicole and I attended a lecture here by Dr. Lisa Izzoni, who is a renowned researcher and advocate for change in the disparity of health care for people with disabilities. The reality of the significant number of people who continue to be institutionalized and whose lives are marginalized because of erroneous perceptions around ability and a lack of autonomy is disparaging. All of our lives are affected. When the contributions of even one individual are diminished or extinguished, I have no doubt that Delinda would have been an indelible force of change and celebration in all of our lives if she had been afforded the opportunities and support to do so. One of my aspirations is to make a positive difference in as many people in the world as I possibly can. Another is being realized with the opportunity to come full circle and address members of the healthcare community here today. Shortly after I was born, the doctors informed my mother that I would never sit up by myself, along with a whole litany of things that I would never do. They strongly encouraged her to institutionalize and try to forget about me, because I would ultimately become a burden to her and our family. When she steadfastly denied their suggestions and went so far as to admonish them for their presumptuousness, they had her see a psychologist because she was obviously in denial. While I'm cognizant that the perceptions and expectations of people with different abilities, as I prefer to be referred, have evolved since 1968, like all civil rights struggles, the need for advocacy and change remain necessary and incremental with an abundant room for progress. It's profoundly rewarding to share and demonstrate the fruits of my mother's faith and commitment. The life I've experienced despite the original prognosis that I was given has been remarkable. I can honestly say I'm almost embarrassed to admit that I've often taken a lot of it for granted. Several months after I was born and after several exploratory and experimental surgical procedures, it became apparent to my mother that my care was precarious and potentially problematic. She didn't know what to do. And so one day in desperation, she picked up the phone. And the operator, throughout our lives, my mom would say, I wish I knew who that woman was, but I'm sure God blessed her. Directed us to the hospital for special surgery after hearing my mother's literal cries for help. Once there, Dr. Lynn and Dr. Root became the primary providers and facilitators of my care, along with a full complement of compassionate medical personnel. The opportunities to acknowledge and thank them and the many people throughout my life who have contributed to my success could never be enough or overstated. I was told I was one of the youngest children to walk on braces and crutches in the Hospital for Special Surgery Therapy Program. I became a poster child for the March of Dimes for several years and otherwise lived an extraordinarily normal childhood. I've always said that without expectations, people are less likely to develop aspirations. And the expectations my mother imbued into the world with her galvanizing statement to the doctors, he's my son, and whatever he's capable of, he will not only survive, but he will live, became the foundation for my life and those around me. My siblings, grandparents, and community quickly adopted this perspective as I developed and engaged in the world. Every aspect of my life became marked with how and rarely with if. My siblings were adamant that I would do my share of the chores. So to this day, I use a task chair in my kitchen to do dishes and cook. I vacuum with the, a shop vac. And while my husband does the majority of our laundry, 
because of the division of labors in our home and the fact that he's slightly more OCD. <laughs> I'm grateful to have the capacity to th do this and many other tasks that allow me to live independently. I'm also unashamed to ask for help when I need it, because after all, we all need assistance every now and again. Growing up, I learned how to jump rope and play hopscotch on my hands. My grandparents bought me my first skateboard. My mom taught me to swim in a pool in our yard. My brother then took me to the beach to facilitate my first swim and make sure I didn't drown. My sister taught me my first dance step. It was the box. It was the early 80s. <laughs> my mother would always joke that I was either doing gymnastics or dancing in her womb because her stomach would bulge and move in mysterious ways. And she knew that there was something different about this pregnancy. Sorry. Perhaps that's how the umbilical cord became wrapped around my legs and my neck multiple times, hampering the blood flow and development of my lower extremities. The rhyme or reason of my condition was never really significant to me. This was my body. This is how I was born. Unlike many people with disabilities and some people, the transition to an entirely different paradigm of life is just that, an entirely different experience. And so as Nicole said, my experience and my abilities cannot speak to that of everyone. I learned to view my particular uniqueness as a blessing in disguise. Performer at heart, designed to inspire, is how I addressed Cirque du Soleil when I auditioned for them in 2014. I've overcome many things in my life, my body, has been a relatively small thing, no pun intended. Sexual orientation, relationships, substance abuse, finances, and the perceptions of others have proved to be far greater challenges for me. Learning to do gymnastics and acrobatics led to appearances on Sunday morning with Charles Kuralt and Ripley's Believe It or Not. for being a high school champion gymnast. I remember when my family gathered around the TV for Sunday morning's caption. We were all excited because they had come and interviewed us in our home and they had, um, you know, come to my competition where I placed fifth in New York City championships. And when the marquee came up for Sunday morning, I don't know if you're familiar with the format, but. I read the caption that I knew was mine, and my heart began to sink. And when Charles Kuralt said, Robert Lipsight brings us the story of a wheelchair full of fight, I was devastated. I was a wheelchair, you know? My wheelchair wasn't doing gymnastics. I was. And they neglected to see the human being. And so it really soured the entire experience of appearing on television. And I remember my whole family was kind of like nonplussed afterwards. It was kind of awkward and disappointing. And so it led to my need to constantly redefine myself in a world that I felt like viewed me erroneously based on stigmatizing stereotypes and presumptions. If you look at these captions, Ricky Daniels is a 17-year-old man confined to a wheelchair. He has no use of his legs. And then it goes on to talk about me doing gymnastics. Well, I didn't swing the wheelchair around on the pommel horse with me. So I clearly wasn't confined to it. Birth defect victim asked for March support. Do I look like a victim in that smile? The reality of this language has changed somewhat in our lives, but the stigmas and perceptions persist, and we have to continue to combat them through ballroom dance and whatever other mediums are available. As I approach 50, I'm finally embracing and bringing to life the words of wisdom 
that my mother shared with me many years ago. One day, as we were walking to the parking lot in our community in the Bronx, I noticed a woman looking at me. And I turned to my mom. I had long grown used to the inquiry of the world, the consistent stares and glances, the whispers, parents shushing their children. But I had not yet reconciled the horror and pity I often empathized in their gaze. I said, Mom, why do people look at me the way they do? She said, well, Ricky, you know you're different. And people just don't understand. For a moment, I was concerned that she had missed the nuance of the question. <laughs> but being my mom and having journeyed with me, she too saw their gaze. And she proceeded by saying, I believe that God creates each of us unique and special for a purpose and loves us just as we are. Consider the flowers of a field. They come in all shapes and sizes, all colors and designs. They're all beautiful and serve a purpose. And yet many of them are still considered weeds. We walked silently the remainder of the way to the car as I pondered what she said. And while she had not yet become a pastor, I'm gathering my mom prayed that her words would comfort and encourage me. I'm to everything there is a season, and I'm blessed to say that I had the opportunity to remind my mom of that conversation before she passed or went home, as she referred to it, and had it engraved on her stone. That her words not only encouraged me, but they had actually planted the seed for the purpose of my life. I've always been grateful to God for my mother, and I'm eternally thankful to my mom for my relationship with God. Because after many seasons of warm and dry, flood and drought, death and renewal in my life, the seed they planted is germinating. And I'm finally becoming the man God created me to be. So in closing, I'd like to say again, I'm profoundly grateful to be here with you today. Especially in lieu of the fact that were it not for my mother's faith and commitment for the expectations of my life and the opportunities she afforded me to live it, I might not have been. The sweetness of opportunity and expectations is the title of my portion of our presentation. And hopefully, you collected a lollipop on the way in. And if you didn't, or you've eaten yours, <laughs> please collect one on the way out. Because I'm going to ask that you display those prominently somewhere in your lives. And may they serve as visual reminders of our sharing here today, and encourage you to always consider and acknowledge the full spectrum of our capacities to excel and contribute regardless of our circumstances, if given the opportunities and expectations to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Nicole and I are now going to perform our last performance piece. Just briefly before we perform our last number, um, I'd like to share with you that the most important reason why Rick and I believe that wheelchair ballroom can change perspective about disability is because it shows disability in a way that the medical gaze has been incapable of capturing and the social gaze has been unwilling to acknowledge. So with that, we would like to leave you with our last piece.
Thank you, Nicole and Rick, for sharing your art of wheelpa uh, wheelchair ballroom dancing with us and really shaping um, the awareness and attitudinal, attitudinal barriers that um, in sharing with us. Um, there's still time for questions. So uh, for Nick, uh, for Rick, I'm sorry, for Nicole and Rick. So if you, we have microphones, Andrea has a microphone as well as we have um, uh, microphones on the side. Hi, good afternoon. First of all, it was an amazing performance. But I wanted to ask, how long have you been dancing independently of each other and then together? Because you were just incredible. Um, so together, we've been dancing since my sophomore year of college, which was last year, so about a year and a half now. Um, and individually, um, I started dancing when I was six. Rick, he's... <laughs> <laughs> um, but I grew up in the Bronx, break dancing and, uh, and whatnot. And my sister really taught me my first dance session. Uh, when I was 12, I used to go to a disco, a teenage disco. And even though I wasn't quite a teen, my mom went the first night, you know. And I think they looked at me and went, sure, you can come in and watch. <laughs> That's not how it turned out. But, but yeah, so then, you know, I've kind of been dancing just for fun throughout my life. But professionally, I guess I started dancing uh, around... Sometimes I call her mommy. <laughs> and I call him grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have a question? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask you about the wheelchair in general. How has it changed since, like, I'm sure that there's been some kind of, like, you have a dancing wheelchair, right? No. No? This is my wheelchair. I wish I had a dancing wheelchair. Right. Like well, economically, I can't afford, like a lot of people have like sports chairs and then they have their other, you know, right. it just hasn't been in my, my paradigm to be able to afford, you know, to get multiple chairs, you know. So this poor thing takes a beating. So I was yeah. going to ask if you chose that versus the other one, but okay, I see. Well, I've, I've chosen these in general because like my life is very engaging. When Nicole mentioned, very, you know, yeah. the person getting in and out of the car, she was actually talking about a story I had shared with her. Oh, so, goodness. so yeah, so it was a personal story. Did, have you used a dancing wheelchair yet? Or? Nope. No. No. In fact, well, list, some of them right? are cantered quite a bit, and I don't know yeah. if I like that because it's like very different. So oh, I don't know. You work with what you're used to, I guess. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Of course. Mm -hmm. The sports chairs are usually not covered fully by insurance, even though they can be a lot more comfortable for sports because um, they're usually made of titanium, which is very light, and then it's very easy to maneuver in them. But maybe we'll do a fundraiser for that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm a nutritional science major and I'm on the pre-med track and this summer I was actually working under Dr. Rupert um, in physical medicine rehabilitation here. So going that route, but I was very inspired by her. <laughs> Communications. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank Sincerely. You.